What's up, everybody? Jensen Cummings here. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Today, we're talking Besser Podcast 182, Colorado-style barbecue with Carl Felenius of Owl Bear Barbecue. Carl, thank you for being on. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Best Served Hot, this channel, we focus on hot food trends, unique foods, emerging cuisines, and I'm very fascinated as there is an opportunity I see for Colorado barbecue to start to kind of find a lane for itself as it is not necessarily known for its own unique barbecue style yet some of what Carl's doing has been fascinating to me so I'm excited to talk about that tell people Owl Bear barbecue what can they expect from you all right so we're a small little barbecue spot right down in uh, on Larimer Street we do all wood cooked barbecue uh, a super old school style uh, lots of brisket lots of uh, ribs and all the regular stuff and We've got some fun specials here and there uh, that definitely fall more into this category of Colorado barbecue that we're going to be discussing today. But uh, yeah, high quality, well-sourced meats, ultra humane, all that kind of fun stuff, just cooked as well as we can possibly cook it. And uh, that's what we're trying to do for everybody. I love it. When I first came across you, you were at the bazaar of Finn's Manor, right? You had the, uh, the truck, the trailer there. And yeah. now how long have you been in the brick and mortar location? Been in the brick and mortar location uh just under a year and a half uh our first year anniversary was actually when we were closed during uh the first shutdown um during that main shutdown time and uh yeah so just over the a year a bit okay so let's uh great we're gonna talk colorado barbecue i'm excited about that and uh want to go back when did you first catch the hospitality bug when did you get into this crazy industry so i Got I I, I've, I did a little bit of cooking here and there, uh, and I delivered Chinese food in college and had a nice. lot. Of, yeah, I I, uh, I kind of it was always an industry I ended up kind of coming back to a little bit, but I didn't have a ton of ex experience in it um, until I uh, I was living in Texas, so having a really hard time finding work, and then I got a job doing an overnight shift at a barbecue food truck, a uh, place called Blue Ox that isn't around anymore. Um, and I was hired, I would basically watch the fires all night and I would, the, the place that the food truck was located in, it's a spot called the buzz mill, which is a 24 hour coffee shop. That's also a bar when it's legal, legal alcohol hours. And they had a giant outdoor space. So I cleaned the whole outdoor space and, uh, watched the fires, did a little bit of barbecue stuff. Um, and, uh, that's when I got into it. Barbecue itself, cooking barbecue hooked me pretty hard Yeah, right around. Like I liked the. The weird hours and uh kind of the alchemy of it um i don't know if i necessarily ever caught the hospitality bug the same way a lot of other people have i just really like cooking food that people makes people happy more than i actually like serving it to them <laughs> <laughs> oh that's fascinating let's get into that because barbecue is such a a labor of love for sure so much time goes into it so much effort goes into it and then when you serve it, it's so simple. You throw it on some paper and you get it out the door, right? You throw it on the scale, you get it out the door. And so, you know, 99% of the time spent on that interaction is happening on the cooking side. So I'm fascinated in that. Uh, lay the groundwork for people. For anybody who follows you in Denver and you're talking about Texas barbecue, it is something completely different down there. Uh, having spent a lot of time, especially in Austin, and eating a lot of barbecue in Austin. It's like a way of life. It's like something you don't understand if you haven't been there, and especially if you're not from there. Even me coming there, I, I still didn't quite understand it. So lay the groundwork. Why is barbecue so so heralded in Texas? Well, I think Texas, first and foremost, it's a culture that's just very um, carnivorous. Uh, they yeah. really... They, they are really into eating their meat, but there's also just such a strong sense of uh, cultural pride there that you don't see with a lot of other places. Um, Texas barbecue is such a Texas thing that they people there are so proud of it being a big part of their culture that they will work extra hard to make sure that it's done perfectly. There's a lot of, uh, well, in a lot of way, a lot of snobbery about how sure. the food is cooked, which I fall into myself. Um, you know, it's all oak wood fires or hickory or 
pecan, but it's fire. It's got to be cooked with a fire. There's not a lot of places that are um, considered all that good that are using um, any sort of assisted smoker, any sort of gas or electric or pellet smokers. It's really got to be, it's very uh, traditional and uh, faithful to that tradition in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's a matter of cultural pride for a lot of people to not only uh, eat barbecue, but to eat it regularly. <laughs> yeah, um, another thing that's fascinating is the way that it is, the, the, the locations are set up. Most of the great places that I've been were trailers in food courts or a trailer out in a field. Like it wasn't necessarily, you know, in the downtown corridor, like shiny glitzy locations. Like they were a little like rough and tumble, which was really cool. I think of La Barbecue, one of, you know, the iconic places down there. And there's basically what, six or seven other food stalls in there that are almost like accoutrements to the barbecue. You're waiting in line at the barbecue for two hours. You want a snack. So the place is there or you have the barbecue and then you want dessert. So everything around it is like an accoutrement. It was just like a fascinating dynamic. Why are pe people willing to wait so long in line and why are barbecue places, you know, trailers, trucks, shacks? Why is that the medium to deliver that, that well, culturally relevant food? A lot of it has to do with probably like zoning regulations uh, uh, as well as other things. It's, it's hard Very to set practical. Up. I thought it was going to be this big philosophical thing. Like you started with It's practical that as well. There's yeah. definitely that as well. Um, but there's a lot of the mentality that, you know, you need to be burning wood and having a live fire outside in a downtown area is not something that's easy to accomplish. As we found out when we were trying to build out our restaurant in Denver, which is just right on Larimer close to downtown. Um, it's, so it's a little bit of that. Then there's also just the cost effectiveness of opening your business um, and doing it out of a food truck makes so much more sense than spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on trying to open a brick and mortar um, that for a space that or a, a, an idea that hasn't even been uh, tested yet, really, like there's such a high level of competitiveness with barbecue places yeah. in Texas, especially. Um, that uh, you have to make sure that people are going to want to come eat your food before you start spending all that money on building out a fancy restaurant. Um, so a lot of people do start out as a truck like we did and then make the move into a brick and mortar eventually. Eventually, um, For some people, that doesn't make a ton of sense. There's a lot of barbecue spots down there that started as a truck and then moved into a brick and mortar, but their brick and mortar is really just like a covered seating area. Right their food truck that they still serve all of the food out of um i mean barbecue in general is just kind of you know when you're doing it in a really traditional way you're out in the elements cooking with fire you everything is outside everything is very um rough in that sense and uh, so it doesn't it makes a lot of sense in that way also that they would um just kind of set it all up outside. It, it's keep it simple, keep it keep it straightforward. There's no reason to start making things too complicated when they don't need to be. Oh, we're good at that in the restaurant industry, making things too complicated for sure. So then let's let's talk for you personally. You make the transition from uh, the trailer, the kind of the food court bazaar at Finn's Manor, uh, to your own brick and mortar location. Why did you Why did you make that transition? Why was that important for you? What did that allow you as a an operator? Book and the way that we have things set up makes it really difficult for us to operate within Denver code, just not even just health code, but fire code, zoning code, everything code. So by the time we like we had a business license and all that stuff. And when we first opened, we kind of snuck through some regulatory stuff that um, ended up getting updated that fall. And we just kind of went for it a little bit, to be honest. We just kind of opened up and made it happen. Um, and uh, we were definitely operating outside of pretty much every code that we could have been. <laughs> so the city found out- A lot us of gray. Like, good job for doing what you're doing, I guess, and being successful with it. And the health inspector was like, yeah, pretty much everything is exactly how it should be, except mm. for like the way that you're set up in the first place. Uh, so you're, you're going to need to shut this all down and figure out some different way to set things up. 
um, and this space was available that we're in now. And uh, we had, we're good friends with the landlords over there. We built our first smoker in that parking lot. We ended up building our second smoker in that parking lot too. But it, uh, it was just, it was a smooth-ish transition. Getting the brick and mortar open was a nightmare. Uh, yeah. getting, just getting through uh, all of the um, planning parts with the city was really difficult. But we got there, we got it open, we made it happen. It took way longer than it needed to, but uh, it, we did it. <laughs> we got yeah. there. It's always harder, takes longer, and costs more money. That is, that is truth every oh, yeah. time in the in the restaurant industry uh is is denver difficult for barbecue when it comes to regulations as opposed to other markets that you're familiar with yes but that's just because there's not a ton of precedent for it right um, uh, at least with health code and fire code and all that kind of stuff there's and zoning code there's just not really there hasn't been a lot of people who are like yeah we're gonna stand outside in the middle of february next to a fire making sure we're getting our food cooked there's just not, it's just not part of what people do up here, which uh, is understandable. We have such hot summers and such cold winters. It's, it's kind of a crazy person's job, but we don't, we don't mind. We don't mind. We're all a little bit crazy. I hear that. Well, I'm, I'm interested in I ask because we've had conversations with people from, from the city, excise and license, things like that. And I'm always fascinated, like where there is the disconnect potentially. And to your point, there's not a lot of precedence. You mentioned that there was some evolution in that. Do you feel like it's moving in the right direction, just not fast enough? Or is there kind of stalemates that you see? Um, in Denver, it's, uh, well, I, I'm like, you know, more places have been uh, opening up. Like Hank's Texas Barbecue, awesome dudes, great yep. food. They're doing all wood-fired barbecue. And uh, they were able to get through the process a little bit quicker. Um, you know, the biggest, the biggest disconnect comes with that all wood fire and having a smoker that's outside. Almost every single meeting I had with the city when we were working on getting open was a conversation about where's the gas line for the smoker? Where's the smoker plug in? And we're like, it's mm -hmm. not, it's just small propane tanks that we modified and turned into smokers that we burn wood. And then there's always the issue of, um, there's a nice little loophole in the Denver uh, law about um, fires. Is technically it's against the law to have a fireplace or a, uh, an outdoor fire pit or something like that as, um, in the city of Denver. But there's a caveat that you can have live fire if it's for barbecue. So we were able to, <laughs> okay. to get the to to get the restaurant open. Um, Interesting. All right. Well, I want to I want to offline. I want to talk to you more about that because I'm always interested in the way that uh, where where there's the intersection between regulation, legislation, and then uh, the adoption of practices in restaurants. So anyway, I want to talk barbecue. Let's talk about food now, man. Let's let's talk about that. So one of the things that I've seen from you that was completely fascinating to me as I'm thinking about Colorado barbecue and the way that it can create its own identity, and you do these unbelievable lamb shanks, right? And lamb is one of those ingredients that Colorado is internationally known for. Yet we don't see a lot of it used in barbecue. A lot of times we're kind of hearkening to, you know, burnt ends of Kansas City or whole hog of Carolina or Memphis ribs or 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 brisket from Texas, you know, all amazing things. Yet those are all coming from somewhere else. I saw the lamb and I was like, this is an opportunity to potentially kind of cement an ingredient, a technique that is purely Colorado. So so talk about that. So um when we reopened, like we've done some lamb specials here and there. We'd done it, we had done it a bunch back in the food truck. But uh, when everything was going crazy with the coronavirus and meat prices were all over the place, we couldn't even get brisket for a few weeks. So we're, we, it was a really cool opportunity for us to start sourcing more locally. And uh, I haven't found any local beef that I really love. Um, there's some good stuff, but. Um, Colorado is just not the best state for beef, but it is the absolute best state for lamb. Um, our lamb is just spectacular and we have some amazing local farmers. We use uh, Boulder Family Farms, uh, the Buckner family. They, yep. they raise beautiful, beautiful lamb. And um, yeah, we started doing a variety of different cuts from them and we really fell in love with the, 
the Colorado, uh, it's called a Denver rack. It's uh, basically the lamb spare ribs mm -hmm. and the shanks. And the shanks were a bit of a process to figure out how to get them super tender and rich and juicy. But um, man, once we figured it out, they were really coming out beautifully. Um, the biggest problem for us, honestly, as a barbecue place is just uh, the cost. Your yield on big cuts of meat that you cook for a really long time is always really minimal. And uh, when you're paying more for local meat, it just starts bumping prices up yeah. and higher. And uh, so we're going to have an event like here and there as specials. Um, we're going to bring the lamb ribs back probably as a pretty regular uh, menu item. But there was a point also where our menu was just getting too big. Once we got brisket back and beef ribs back and a bunch of other stuff that are people know us for and are used to and really um, crave. I mean, as much as we try not to be just a Texas barbecue place, coming from a Texas background and having worked uh, the places I worked and whatnot, people want to come and eat brisket, 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 brisket. We are pretty much a brisket and mac and cheese restaurant when you start mm -hmm. looking at all the numbers. Um, we sell enough of the other stuff to make it work, but brisket and mac and cheese is are by far our biggest sellers. Um, well, we, when you when you've you know worked at Franklin's, the most famous barbecue place in the country, like people tend to to look for that. It makes a lot of sense. Do you think like barbecue is not cheap? Like let's just stay with Texas, twenty two dollars a pound for briskets or you know or beef rib. So it's a uh, it's pricey. Do you think that there's not enough demand yet for that pricing model here to the potentially to have lamb be a staple item? So we're even we're more expensive than that. Um, yeah. we have to be right now at all to try and just keep our doors open and our employees paid. Um, we also source really high quality meat. Barbecue has the tradition of being a very uh, cost friendly um, cost friendly food to sure. eat. And uh, my biggest problem with that is that's that's entirely based on utilizing the cheapest, gnarliest, most industrial meat products that you can possibly find. Yeah. And I just can't do that. My my soul won't let me cook. <laughs> factory farm yeah and so we pay a whole bunch extra for our for our for our raw product and that's why our food gets so expensive um but at the same time if you're thinking about it if you want to go get a one pound usda prime steak you're going to be paying for a pound of it like 60 70 80 bucks no problem if not more and when we're selling you a pound of meat at 30, you know, 24 to 20 to 30 dollars, that's um, a pretty decent price for something that's going to feed a lot of people. Um, and, uh, or, you know, a good amount of people. It's very rich. It's very, you know, it's powerfully filling food. Yeah. Um, Stick to your ribs, so to speak. So, okay, I'm, I'm fascinated this. I really think. Like, here's what I want. Here's what I want, Carl. I want everybody to be buying that lamb shank every single time they go so that it becomes a staple item on your menu. Like, I just want to talk to people and be like, look, it is so worth it for a couple reasons. Like, to have something that is so Colorado in the segment of barbecue, I cannot tell you how much that matters. To define a cuisine and a culture, when you go to Austin, Texas, you get brisket and beef rib. When you go to Carolina, you get whole hog when you yeah. go to new orleans you get etouffee and beignets like it's a matter of fact and it creates an identity that i think is so palpable and powerful and like we need that we need more of that so like pay more money people first of all <laughs> for whatever those products are Let, let's go a little bit deeper what other products do you see possibility is there the opportunity instead of it being oak is there peach wood or Applewood, things that Colorado has well, bison, That's actually peaches, a, corn. I think of these ingredients. Is there opportunities in other places just besides lamb? Oh, absolutely. And we, we actually use all Colorado oak. There's nice. amazing oak wood that grows here that very few people even realize exists in Colorado. 
Um, it's a uh, small oak. It's called gamble oak. People know it as scrub oak. It's all over Colorado wow. the hills down south. The whole western slope is covered in it. And it's, uh, it's a much smaller oak, but it's not like the same kind of scrub oak that you would find in Texas or Iowa or Kansas. It's not redwood. It's, it's a nice white oak that has a uh, density and flavor very similar to post oak and live oak that you find in Texas. And uh, it's actually, density wise, it's right in between post oak and live oak. And uh, it's just a pain in the butt for um, lumberjacks to put turn it into firewood because it's such a small scrubby tree. So it takes a lot more effort to come out with a lot less wood than if you're cutting down like a giant post oak or something like that. Personally, I like cooking with it way more than I like cooking with any other wood I've ever used. Wow. It's just, it's got a really nice flavor. The density gives you a beautiful ember bed and um, it burns for a really long time at a very consistent temperature. Wow. Um, I really like using fruit woods too. They burn really fast and really hot and yeah. they, uh, they're they really expensive. So you end up going through a lot of wood very quickly. The uh, you know, all wood here is extremely expensive in comparison with most barbecue centric food cultures like in Texas or Kansas City or uh, the Deep South anywhere. They have tons of massive hardwood trees that uh, need to be cleared anyways. So they're paying anywhere from like a half to a quarter of what we do for a quarter wood. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of things that make Colorado barbecue kind of difficult, but there's plenty of resources that make it insanely delicious. Mm -hmm. and, uh, How'd you even come across the oak? Um, I was looking at different wood companies. I knew that I wanted to use uh, local wood if I could. I found this awesome, my favorite wood spot in Denver. Uh, it's called Variety Fi Firewood. It's down in Englewood. And uh, they kept it in stock. So it was kind of a match made in heaven initially. Um, most of the wood companies around here are selling oak that is brought in from somewhere in the Midwest or the South. And uh, it just seems kind of unnecessary to me, honestly. Yeah. Have this great interesting, interesting question. Would driving more demand for that oak drive down the price because then there's more harvest or are we going to take away from your supply? I honestly don't even know. Um, yeah. it, it's a hard, really hard wood to source. I'm looking at trying to find some uh, people who I can source more direct directly from um down on the western slope in different spots i grew up on the western slope so luckily i can have my dad talking to people asking around and that's okay. some good results but um it's just uh most of the lumberjacks i've talked to around here are like nope we just throw in the chipper we're never not going to throw in the chipper and i'm like do you know how much people are spending for a cord of wood in denver yeah. right now how much this is actually worth <laughs> like i don't even care man i don't even care i'm gonna chip it wow um, Nice. Yeah, you're pushing up against a lot of like status quo when it comes to again regulation. Now, when it comes to the way that lumberjacks are harvesting, when it yeah. comes to the way that meat is being produced and brought to you, uh, any of the other products? I mean, bison, massively huge awesome. product here. Figure out what we want to do with bison. It's such a lean meat; it doesn't take yeah. super well to the really extended cooks. Um, but uh, we're trying to figure out something that we can do that would still be uh, cost effective enough to uh, be able to sit on our menu comfortably. You know, if you want to do like a bison tenderloin, that's still going to cost, that's going to, I'm going to have to be selling it for 50 plus bucks a pound. Not many people want uh, to spend 50 bucks on a box of takeout meat. <laughs> so um, it's, yeah. it's a little, it's a little tricky. Um, Figuring out, uh, yeah, the lines that we can draw and where we can, where we can, uh, like, what's the highest level we can go to, and then uh, trying to keep things cost effective as well. So yeah, where's the demand that mic that market for sure? Uh, you mentioned though, you know, one of your contemporaries, Roaming Buffalo, them down there are kind of pushing that forward. And right away, when you and I were rapping before about Colorado style barbecue, you brought them up right away. Do you think like there needs to be a few more people that are jumping into the pool saying we're going to be a Colorado barbecue joint? You know, I think there needs to be more of that kind of mentality in general, even if it isn't so focused on being like Coy and Rachel Webb, who own Rowing Buffalo, are 
awesome. They're doing some really, really cool stuff with bison and with lamb, and uh, they're making a venison sausage. Um, I wish Colorado was a little bit easier to get game game meats that were local. Um, Colorado um, Health Code doesn't let people field dress and then bring it to a USDA facility. Um, meats that are produced in Colorado need to be uh, processed start to finish in a facility. So you can't just get Colorado elk. It has to be that someone hunted and then field dressed and brought to a facility that then um, broke it all down for you. Um, it needs to be elk that was farm raised and then brought to a processing facility and totally processed there. Um, so it just makes things a little bit more difficult to do like local game meats, which is really unfortunate since we have such awesome elk and venison. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah. Rachel and Coy are doing amazing Colorado style barbecue. It's been their goal from day one is to really establish that. Um, I think a lot of people are doing some cool stuff. Uh, Smoke has been doing some awesome green chili stuff. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, uh, Jason up at GQ has been doing some great lamb specials here and there. Wow. Everyone's kind of jumping on board. It's really cool to see people doing more of this stuff. Um, Lamb is so delicious. Bison is so delicious. They just need to be treated right, especially since they're such lean meats that can potentially also be very gamey. So uh, you got to be got to be careful. Make it real delicious. Good. Well, I like that there's some moving and shaking happening around that space. I think there needs to be some thoughtfulness about it. And just, yeah, the fact that all of you are thinking about it, trying to source locally, trying to kind of flip barbecue towards what's happening in Colorado. I mean, you know, I have high hopes that in a generation from now that Colorado barbecue will be in the conversation with other styles of barbecue, not because it's brisket or anything else, but because of some of what you guys are laying the groundwork for. And the, the first people over the wall always get the bloodiest, my friend. So I know it's it's a labor of love for sure. As you mentioned, your brisket and mac and cheese spot, but you're going to keep pushing you know, products that like really resonate with your ethos and support the Buckner family and things like that. Cause I think it truly matters. Any other products on your menu or specials that you come out that people need to pay attention to that they might just look over. Uh, let's throw those out there for people to pay There's attention to really cool sausages, uh, in house yeah. sausages that we're super proud of. That's more of a new thing we were doing. Uh, we still have like our regular sausage that we get made for us by river bear, American meats. Just the uh, Yeah. Runs in. We get all of our meat through through them. Uh, most of it, everything that's not local, we get through River Bear. Um, they're they've been extremely supportive and helpful throughout everything. And their food, all of their meat is amazing. Runson and I have the same beliefs about sourcing the best meat we can afford, uh, and trying to keep it reasonably priced for everyone, all of our customers. But um, we're doing that. We're doing, uh, people really have been going wild over our cheeseburgers. We do a smoked cheeseburger, which is really good. Um, but all of our regular stuff is just, uh, we're just focusing on making sure our regular menu is as consistent as possible, as delicious as possible. And we hit the mark, I would say like at least, at least nine times out of 10, but, um, yeah, barbecue is really hard. Uh, trying to maintain consistency is the single hardest thing about cooking barbecue. Yeah, true story. I like the smoke smoke burger got me thinking people resonate with the uh, the bison burger. You see that obligatorily not done very well on a lot of menus. Yeah, that's an opportunity potentially because you can grind some fat back into that super lean meat to the point you made earlier. So uh, I want to I want to end with always acknowledgement. Acknowledgement so important. And I love that I was just introduced to a new person. Uh, tell us about Chris Bell. Yeah, Chris Bell's awesome. Go to his Go to his coffee shop, Portside. Uh, they've got amazing coffee. His food is awesome. If you don't want barbecue or if you're vegetarian or vegan, yeah. go get his food. He's got stuff that's not vegetarian or vegan, but then like his brown rice bowl is one of the best, healthiest bits of food you can get in the whole city. Um, just check them out. They're awesome. Crema right up the street, right by us. Some of the best people in the business. If you haven't had their food, their food is awesome. And their coffee is amazing. They ruined me on good coffee. Like, I can't <laughs> drink bad coffee anymore. It's because of them. All their baristas are just insanely talented and their coffee choices are just perfect. Um, my whole neighbor, there's so much good food in our neighborhood on the Rhino area. Just come do like a food tour. It's worth it. Yeah. It's totally the Rhino neighborhood, River North neighborhood of Denver 
one of the best food and brewery. It's the most dense brewery pack, 14, 15 breweries within a one mile radius. It's, it's insane. Literally people ask me all the time, right? Uh, I'm going to be in Denver for a day. Where do I go? I literally have a copy and paste list ready to go that I update every three months just to be like, here's where you go. You're included in that list. And I was like, here's the nine places you hit in one day just on Larimer and like Blake Street, pretty much it. So I really appreciate that. And I uh, appreciate you giving the shout outs to a few people. It really matters. The more that we acknowledge the work that we're doing, yet the work that others are doing, I think it, it truly matters. And I appreciate the fact that you're being so thoughtful about, you know, now I know about, I didn't know there was oak in Colorado that was worth a damn. So I really appreciate that as well. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me on so I could talk about some stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, it's been fun. <laughs> All right. Appreciate you. Go uh, go get back to smoking, my friend. Uh, Carl Flenius, owner of Albear Barbecue in Denver, Colorado. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Have a great day, Jensen. Cheers. Peace. All right. Colorado barbecue. It's been on my mind. It's on my mind all the time. I'm fascinated in the opportunity to create a sense of place and purpose within our food scene. And I think there's so many places that you travel to, you just know what you're going to go eat before you even go there. And those are the places that have the biggest draws for tourism, but also just the identity that people have. When you go to places that have a strong food culture and identity, they are so passionate and it's so pure and real and authentic. You feel it and it changes your experience of something simple like smoked brisket. The brisket in Texas is amazing. Experiencing the brisket in Texas, more amazing. And I think Colorado has an opportunity. And when I see things like the lamb shank, it, it makes sense to me. And I think we need to triple down on that. All right. Best served podcast 182. That was Colorado Style Barbecue with Carl Felenius of Owlbeller Barbecue. Again, best served hot. We focus on hot food trends, unique foods, emerging cuisines, and of course, as always, the humans behind those stories because that's who truly matters, who truly makes it all possible. That's it for today. Appreciate you as always. Cheers. <laughs>